Hi, I am Sunna Olofsson Furstenal, the founder and president of Icelandic Roots. This short film will introduce you to a bit of Icelandic history, finding your Icelandic cousins and ancestors, famous Icelanders, and much more about our Icelandic Roots community. Joining me in this presentation, and the person who put it all together, is Doug Hansen. Go and Diane. I am the treasurer and director of geographic information for Icelandic Roots. Our organization is a collaborative one with volunteers from Canada, Iceland, and the United States. I will talk about immigration from Iceland, Icelandic places, and more about the Icelandic Roots organization. So let's begin. Iceland is an island near the Arctic Circle with many active volcanoes, glaciers, and some of the most striking and unique geography in the world. The land of fire and ice. It is located directly over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and is still growing from the magma welling up under the Earth's crust. The North American and Eurasian plates spread apart about two and a half centimeters per year. And Iceland is one of the most volcanically active countries on our Earth. Glaciers cover 11% of Iceland, with mountains, volcanoes, lava, waterfalls, rivers, and sand fields, only 20% of the country is inhabited. Traditions state that the age of settlement was about 870. However, recent research with DNA and carbon dating suggests that Iceland may have been settled much earlier. The archaeological evidence shows us that Gaelic monks from Ireland had lived in Iceland in the 700s. Oral traditions state that the Viking explorers and their slaves landed and created settlements along the shores and the Gaelic monks left Iceland, maybe to avoid the pagan Vikings. They first came to Iceland because they were blown off course in the wild Arctic seas. The settlers of Iceland are often referred to as Vikings, but most of them came as farmers looking to start a new life in a new world. DNA evidence of Icelandic people demonstrate that we descend mainly from Norwegian males and women from the British Isles. It is not known whether the women, and also some men, were captured during raiding or if they were bought at slave markets. It is possible that some of them even joined the Vikings voluntarily. By 930, the government of Iceland was formed. The National Parliament is the oldest surviving parliament in the world and is called Althingi. Once a year, they all met at Thingbetha, now a national park. Here's the Logberg, or the Law Rock, where laws and disputes were carried out and settled. At Icelandic Roots, we have much information about the people who were the settlers and the law speakers, along with all other people who are Icelandic. Many important genealogical books have been written by Icelanders. The Book of Settlements traces the discovery of Iceland and lists the original settlers and place names that still remain today. The Heimskringla was written in the 1200s. And this is actually the reason Norwegians know their history and how we know our relationship to these ancient ancestors too. The arrival of Christianity in the year 1000 eased some religious conflict. Volcanic eruptions, disease, and famine were constant threats. By 1262, the Icelandic people accepted Norwegian rule after the clan wars had left Iceland weakened and unprotected. In 1380, Iceland came under the rule of the Danish crown. In the 1400s, more than half of the population perished due to the plague. In the 1700s, 25% died from Black Death. Volcanic eruptions contributed to the misery 
and reduce the population again and again. By the early 1800s, there were only 47,000 people plus. Trade with Iceland stopped because of the Napoleonic Wars during this time, and although it was tough, there were positive steps towards independence and free trade by the mid-1800s. Now there is much, much more to the history of Iceland, and we do have a great timeline of events in the database, but this was just a brief summary that leads up to the mass immigration from Iceland to North America. To understand Icelandic genealogy, especially from the perspective of a Vester Icelandingur or Western Icelander, one must understand three distinct periods. One in Iceland leading to the immigration, another during settlement in North America, and a third following World War I. Let's continue with Iceland first. Most of the Icelanders were poor subsistence farmers and fishermen, struggling to eke out a meager living within the harsh climatic and economic condition of the time. Most Icelanders were farmers of cattle and sheep, and typically the only real crop was hay to store for the winter feeding of their livestock. All else had to be imported and there was little opportunity to accumulate wealth. By 1870, the population of Iceland had grown to approximately 70,000, yet this was more than could be sustained by the farming and fishing technologies of the time. Facing the prospect of a hard life of farm labor and even possible starvation, many Icelanders welcomed the opportunity for a new life in North America. The reasons for leaving Iceland were many, but primarily centered on economic opportunity and greater religious and political freedom. Having made the fateful decision to leave Iceland for North America, the emigrants now faced the challenge of getting there. Icelandic settlers often would embark on steamships from Sædisfjordr or Vopnafjordr in the east and other ports within Iceland bound for England, Scotland, or even Denmark. Upon arrival there, they would await onward transport, sometimes waiting weeks or months to obtain passage on ships to New York, Quebec, and other east coast ports. After clearing entry with immigration officials, they would proceed onward via ground and water transportation to reach their destinations in the United States and Canada. Here, they would start anew, often receiving assistance from the Icelandic community in their settlement area. Between 1855 and 1920, nearly 20% of the Icelandic population emigrated to North America. The second part of our story takes place within North America itself, as our intrepid settlers make the transition from Iceland to their new homes in the West. In the 1800s, North America experienced a period of great westward expansion, as recently acquired and explored territories were opened up to westward migration and settlement. The offer of free or low-cost land was enticing for many who could brave the rigors of the trail and a life on the prairies and in the mountains of the West. The governments of the United States and Canada created economic incentives for settlers to move westward from the established eastern states and provinces. They also welcomed large numbers of European immigrants to settle the great western expanses. Let's look at where these people went. The first settlers from Iceland were members of the Mormon faith who settled in Spanish Fork, Utah in the period 1855 to 1856. Another early group chose to migrate to South America and settled in Curitiba, Brazil starting in 1863. Still others settled in Wisconsin starting with Washington Island in 1870 and Milwaukee in 1872. By 1873, a large group arrived in Muskoka, Ontario, but most moved on to New Iceland in the Interlake area of Manitoba by 1875. In 1874, another large group settled temporarily in Kinmount, Ontario. Most later moved on to Markland, Nova Scotia, or to New Iceland. 1875 marked the beginning of settlement in Minneota, Minnesota, with most people arriving from Wisconsin. New Iceland, the area along the western shore of Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba, began receiving large numbers of Icelanders in 1875. 
By 1900, the population had increased to around 2,500 people. From New Iceland, immigrants often moved again to new communities such as Winnipeg in 1877 and Dakota Territory in 1878. The Winnipeg Icelandic community continued to grow and rose to approximately 4,000 Icelanders by 1901. Northeastern Dakota Territory also grew rapidly, rising to an estimated population of 2,300 by 1905. As more immigrants arrived from Iceland, settlement expansion and group movement continued unabated. Groups moved to other areas of Manitoba and Dakota. Others expanded westward into Saskatchewan and British Columbia in 1883 and Alberta and Washington Territory by 1888. As can be seen, the settlements and movements were widespread, including movement between the U.S. and Canada as the Icelandic immigrants sought new opportunities and greater freedoms. In the new settlements in Canada and the United States, the arriving Icelanders got to work, creating farms in the prairies, using their farming skills, and adapting to their new environment. Here they faced more severe winters, hotter summers, and different soils and vegetation. They also adjusted to living in remote areas, often distant from transportation networks. To survive, they founded small communities and supported one another while building houses and farms. As communities were established, churches and schools were constructed, and social identities and commercial infrastructures were built. The final part of our story begins in 1914. The onset of World War I cut off most of the flow of immigrants into North America from Iceland. Wartime demand for agricultural and food products dramatically increased worldwide prices, and Icelandic farmers and fishermen enjoyed a time of relative prosperity. Meanwhile, many Western Icelanders took up arms as members of the Allied forces fighting in Europe and other places around the world. World War II had an especially dramatic impact on Iceland. The British and American forces occupying Iceland brought modern infrastructure not seen before. Bridges, roads, airstrips, and ports were constructed all over Iceland to support the war effort. The presence of thousands of Allied troops also created tensions, excitement, brides, and babies. Many Icelandic brides and children found their way to North America after the war. Others were left behind and often ostracized when their soldiers departed. Wartime children leave genealogical puzzles that we still struggle with today. New Icelandic immigrants to the United States and Canada are still arriving, though in much smaller numbers than the peak years prior to 1914. Expatriates come west for their jobs and often stay after meeting future American and Canadian spouses. Some married service members stationed in Iceland then return with them to the west. In summary, we need to be aware of three related periods. The first is the history of Icelandic fishermen and farmers under Danish rule, and the arduous economic and climatic conditions in Iceland which led to the migration. The second is the period of settlement and community growth and mobility within North America. The third is ongoing change that has char characterized the friendly relationship between Iceland and North America since World War I. This friendship is symbolized by the gift of the Leifur Eriksson statue in Reykjavik from the United States in 1930. Understanding these conditions and these histories will help us better understand our individual genealogies and when and why our ancestors move from place to place. Icelandic Roots is a very unique and vast organization. There are many perks with a membership and the features and offerings continue to grow. This is the main Icelandic Roots website there's a great deal of free information here. For members only, we do offer many additional features and benefits. You can join as a member by clicking on the Get Started button. I'm now going to show you the basics of the database. Our team hosts training sessions for new members and there are online tutorials. The database can be a little overwhelming, but I promise once you know your way around, you will have so much fun and really learn a lot. 
After you log in, you'll see my page. I'm using an ancestor to protect the living people. See the lines of tabs under the photo? Individual, family, ancestors, and more. There's a suggest button where members suggest changes or additions for their family. You will see parish records, notes, census, immigration, passenger lists, and more. Scrolling down, you see his parents. He has birth and foster parents. Then his wife and their children. Keep scrolling down, you'll see portraits, family photos, farms, and residence photos from Matsvibland, churches, cemeteries, and more. Some pages will have midwife or military info, plus so many other possibilities. Many immigrants are not in the excellent book called Vesterfar Scrawl. This highly reliable resource lists 14,268 Icelanders who emigrated to North America between 1870 and 1914. However, our team has found many people listed in Vesterfar's Grau as immigrating, but they never left. Those who emigrated but returned to Iceland, there are many duplicates, and there are thousands of people who did immigrate but they are not listed in this resource. Only through extensive genealogy research have these facts been pieced together and put into the Icelandic Roots database. This passenger list is from 1855 and shows Icelanders who emigrated to Utah. We continue adding new immigrants even until today. With more than 2,300 sources, and connecting all this information, we continue to solve family mysteries and preserve the Icelandic story in this unique and interesting site. On the left side of the page, you'll see collections and documents full of important information. There's stories about immigration, the journey, books, diaries, letters, documents, and records, as well as the immigration passenger lists, ports, ships, and more. Learning about the ships and ports is so interesting. If you click on the Ancestor tab, you will get a chart of four generations. Look at the blue line up near the top. You will see all the various charts and reports you can make. This is just on the Ancestor tab. There's other reports under the other tabs like Descendants and Relationships and the Interactive Map feature. There's a lot for you to see. Naming traditions in Iceland seem a little complicated at first, and immigrants changed their names. Thorstensen became Stone, Goodmanson became Goodman, Gislason became Gillies, and many took on location names from Iceland. We have a comprehensive, also known as name report, as well as other reports like clergy, drowned, Fjalkona, etc. Do you want to know how you're related to famous and interesting Icelandic people? If you go to this special report, you can do just that. And while you're on this page, you can read their stories. And yes, we are descended from Vikings, from kings and queens. And there's many famous people even now living in modern times. The timeline of historical events helps us to understand the important and interesting events that happened from before the settlement of Iceland through today. You can learn about our triumphs, disease, volcanic eruptions, and more. The Cousins Across the Ocean Project preserves all this information into our secure database. With the Relationship Calculator and the very, very famous My Cousins pages, you can find out just how you're related to pretty much everybody who's Icelandic. Maybe you're interested in farms, midwives, military, or other media items. Members send us photos, documents, letters, and we attach them to their family. Media can also include books, recordings, headstones, videos, and more. Do you know all your cousins? 
I sure don't. But you can keep track of them and make sure they are preserved in the My Cousins feature. And if you are Icelandic, your information is being securely preserved in the Icelandic Roots database, where the layout is easy to navigate and the privacy is very strict. The information is updated every day by our team of genealogists. We want to make sure you're connected and your family is preserved in our shared Icelandic story. Come and join the fun! Icelandic names and places can be very difficult and intimidating for Western Icelanders to understand. Yet, to understand Icelandic genealogy, one must have some knowledge of Icelandic geography and place names. Displaying them in map form makes them far easier to locate and to comprehend. Western Icelanders often know the general region of Iceland from which their ancestors came, but tell us that the farm names were largely indecipherable to them prior to using the Icelandic Roots database or actually visiting the farms in person. I will show you how Icelandic Roots makes Icelandic places much more approachable. So, why is this important? First, Iceland is unique. Most geographic systems in the world are based on cities and towns. However, Iceland is based on farms. Second, genealogy involves hunting for and discovering primary documents to verify or refute key facts and to fill in missing branches. We cannot possibly find these treasures without knowing where to search. Our knowledge of places directly impacts our ability to conduct genealogy research. Maps like this one can help in our understanding. Besides language barriers, Icelandic places can be difficult to understand because many geographic boundaries have changed, and modern ones often bear little resemblance to historic ones such as Sisla or counties shown here. Genealogy records most often use the older classifications, so we use technology to help demystify places for our members. In fact, we always include the actual geographic coordinates, when possible, of every location in the Icelandic Roots database. The addition of latitude and longitude is extremely powerful as a visual genealogy tool. This map, from the Ancestors tab, for example, shows six generations back from one of my ancestors. Each pin represents the geographic location of an event from their lives, such as a birth, death, marriage, or census record. With a map view, one can immediately see the region of Iceland they inhabited. By the way, the orange pins are farms and the green ones are parishes. We use Google Maps for our visual data presentation, so all the familiar functionality is present. We even include Google Street View for those streets and highways that have been photographed. Similar maps are available for each individual page as well. Using these maps, we can instantly visualize movement and migration patterns. Map data can also point us toward resources to explore for, for future research, highlighting which parish books to review, for instance. At Icelandic Roots, we are very proud of our interactive maps and how they complement our other collections and add to the rich history of our ancestors. The core aims of Icelandic Roots are to educate, promote, and preserve an interest and knowledge in the history of Iceland and its people, and to strengthen the links between Icelanders and those of Icelandic descent in North America. In 2003, George Freeman created a genealogy center at the annual Deuce of August Icelandic Heritage Celebration in Northeast North Dakota. I joined in with him that first year. We used various resources, including the very valuable online database by Haltdown Helgeson. George Haltdown and I worked together to continue building the genealogy databases and created a very fun project called Cousins Across the Ocean, where we found living cousins for Icelanders who were visiting in North America. In 2012, I traveled around Iceland for three weeks as a guest speaker and started a blog and website called Icelandic Roots to educate others about Iceland and my trip. The next year, in 2013, Haltdown decided to retire and he entrusted me to keep his work going. This was the foundation for the Icelandic Roots database. 
Over time, many talented and dedicated people have joined as volunteers to grow the organization and make it more unique and a better resource. No one owns Icelandic Roots. It's governed by a board of directors and various individuals offering their talents in areas of expertise and in positions of trust and accountability. Genealogists process cousins across the ocean forms, answer emails from our database members, and do research. Our experts are available to answer your questions too. We give presentations and special seminars both online and in person. In the legacy section are genealogists who we miss so much because they passed away. But here is where we honor their memory. Initially focusing on the immigrants to North America, the database has grown into so much more. There are tens of thousands of media items, including naturalization and citizenship papers. There's letters, photos, cemetery information, obituaries, biographies, and more. With specialty IT gurus, webmasters, and technical assistants, they keep all the sites up to date and secure. Social media is an important feature of Icelandic Roots. It is a free offering that we use to connect, educate, promote, and communicate about everything Icelandic. We have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and a private Facebook group. The social media team also writes amazing blog posts each week, so make sure you sign up. We share photos and recipes. They're also creating a new podcast. And we have a Samtal hour for member chats and plan for a writer's society group. See Pinterest, YouTube, Vimeo, and many other interesting offerings. We have an Icelandic Roots Library with volunteers who have library science degrees. We also have translators who can translate to and from several languages. There are many people on our team. Some give a little and some give a lot. We meet weekly to build relationships, learn more, share resources, and strategize how to improve the Icelandic Roots community. Giving back makes a difference in our lives and to the lives of others. Many people wear multiple hats and work on their favorite projects. Our volunteers make comments such as, it's so fun to be a part of this team. It's an honor to work with this outstanding group. Being a part of the IR team is, brings me so much joy and Icelandic Roots is so much bigger than myself. So if you'd like to join our team, please let us know. There are many opportunities and you might be like us and become lifelong friends with the same passion for Iceland. Suna spoke about the Icelandic Roots team, the volunteers who make it all happen. I wanna share a little bit about our organization and our policies and procedures. First, we are a nonprofit organization and all our mission-related work is done by volunteers. We are also registered as a 501c3 public charity by the U.S. Internal Revenue Service, meaning that charitable contributions are generally tax-deductible for U.S. citizens. More importantly, it means that we devote all our revenue after necessary expenses toward mission-related scholarships and grants to keep our Icelandic heritage alive. Some recent recipients of Icelandic Roots Heritage Grants include the Gimli Icelandic Camp and New Iceland Heritage Museum in Manitoba, the Snorri Foundation in Reykjavik, the Icelandic Immigration Center in Hofsos, Manassas Viking Festival in Virginia, Historic Markerville in Alberta, East Iceland Immigration Center in Vopnafjord, the Blaine Icelandic Heritage Society in Washington State, and the Icelandic Association of Utah as well as Icelandic cemeteries in North Dakota and Manitoba, among many others. We have also awarded Icelandic language and Snorri cultural exchange scholarships to young people from all over Canada and the United States, and provide genealogy information for all Snorri programs, including Snorri West visitors from Iceland. We encourage everyone to explore the free resources on our public website, www.icelandicroots.com. Look for a set of events, and if you would like to see us at your event, please let us know. You can contact us at support at icelandicroots.com. 
In closing, this was just a very brief overview of the volunteer work being done by the Icelandic Roots team. We are sure having lots of fun. A huge thanks to our team and to all the supporting members. We have met so many wonderful friends and cousins along the way. If you are Icelandic or know someone who is, let's get connected. Be a part of our growing community. Come and pay it forward and join us. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. Thank you. Takk fyrir. And have a wonderful day.